Um, thank, I just want to begin by, am I okay, loud, too loud? When I start talking fast, you know what happens. Um, I just want to begin by thanking everyone for being here. I just know that, um, I just, I mean, I can't really actually begin to thank you enough because I know that with your busy, busy lives, everyone here, everyone here is busy. Um, and I know it was a sacrifice for you to leave whatever it was. You probably had a dozen other things, a dozen other options of things to do tonight, and it just, if, if anything, nothing I say blesses you, just please know that, that your generosity to the Lord will not go um, un, unblessed. And so just, again, I know it's a sacrifice for you to be here. You probably had a long day, and to leave home after supper or <laughs> before supper and come to church is not necessarily um, the first thing. But I just, again, thank you. Um, just thank you so much. I, and I just pray that um, God blesses all of us here tonight. Let's just, let's actually do, let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father in he heaven, we thank you and praise your name. Thank you for the gift of life, and thank you for the gift of faith. We ask that you please send your Holy Spirit upon all of us gathered here tonight. Your Holy Spirit, to clear our minds and fill them with your truth. Your Holy Spirit, to open our hearts and fill them with your love. We consecrate this night, this parish mission, and our entire lives to you through the intercession and protection of Our Lady of Victory as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. So I'm going to kind of do this up and down thing. I pretty much have decided that already. The three steps. And not to desecrate the sanctuary, but just because I'm really, when I'm down here, I'm not the tallest guy in the world. So like it's helpful for me to gain some altitude. Um, but I was thinking about this. This is a great opportunity to have a Lenten, a Lenten mission. Because one of the things when it comes to Lent is what we typically think of when it comes to Lent is, okay, I'm going to give up this, give up that. And then you get to St. Patrick's Day. You're like, oh, shoot. I gave up beer, and then you have to push it, power it through today, you know. But we sometimes think of Lent as just being kind of the day that we, or the season, that maybe we just try to, you know, lose a little weight, grow in some discipline, and uh, maybe, like, maybe kind of sort of get closer to the Lord. But where Lent comes from, back in the ancient church, you know, um, Lent for, specifically designed for people who are getting ready to get baptized. They were getting ready to come into the church, and actually— in that, I want to I want to take a, a second to uh, to welcome a certain group. I know there's different groups who are here tonight, but there was one group um, called the Inclusion Pro, for part of the Inclusion Program, and they're they're people who already belong to Christ. They believe in Jesus, and they're coming into the church. I believe at Easter, and that's that's the goal. That's the direction. That's the so Lent's actually for you more than anyone else. And if you're not baptized, Lent is more for you. If you're planning on getting baptized at Easter, than everyone else, it's kind of like if we get to those of us who are already Catholic, we kind of get just we kind of get to just come along with you to Lent, through Lent, to Easter. Because in the early church, the first couple centuries, you know how long it took for you to get baptized. If you were in like the early church RCIA program, it took you up to three years until you were baptized. Once you started like following Christ, you started like, I want to know more about the Lord. A lot of times it would take three years. I mean, of course, at Pentecost, it took one day, <laughs> you know. Peter gives this homily or sermon. They're like, what should we do? Get baptized. Okay. So that was like basically our RCIA program that lasted roughly 15 minutes. But after that, in the early church, according to a guy named Hippolytus, who wrote this book called Apostolic Traditions, that was the only thing that I know that's impressive. His name was Hippolytus, Apostolic Traditions. He said that in the early church, it took three years. The first year was like, okay, you want to know a little bit more about what these Christians believe. And so people will start teaching you. In the second year, though, it wasn't just about learn what Christians believe. It was now, how is that going to change the way you live? And it was like, it was this, this movement from, okay, here's what we believe. Here's the content of our faith. And then all of a sudden, it was like, okay, you know, this is going to have to change how you walk through your life. And the third year, it was time to make some really serious decisions. In fact, Hippolytus talks about this. He says that there were people, if they had certain jobs, they couldn't become Christians and keep those jobs. Two of the jobs that he mentions are you couldn't be a soldier and become a Christian and still be a soldier. And you couldn't be a teacher 
and become a Christian and still be a teacher. And it wasn't not because soldiers, you know, they were engaged in violence. That wasn't the reason why. It was because a soldier, if you're in the Roman army and you were a soldier, every morning when you came out of your barracks, one of the things you had to do is take a pinch of incense and go to a statue of Caesar and there's a bowl of, you know, burning brazier in front of his statue. You need to throw a pinch of incense into that brazier and offer up sacrifice with Caesar as Lord. And so if you're going to do that, you can't on Sundays say, Jesus is Lord, and then Monday through Saturday, say, Caesar is Lord. You have to choose one or the other. And same thing when it came to teachers. One of the reasons why you couldn't be a teacher and become a Christian as well is because we all know teachers are mean, mean people. (laughs) And just they don't fit, you know. That's not true. That's not the reason why. The reason why is because if you were a teacher in the Roman society, you had to teach the Roman myths as true. You had to teach that there was a god named Zeus, and there was Hercules, and there was Hera, and there was Apollo, and all those kind of different gods. And you couldn't on Sunday say there's one god, but then Monday through Saturday say there's many gods. You had to make a decision. And so because of this, first year, you got to learn some content. What did Christians believe? Second year, you got to start changing your life. But third year, this is time. Time to make some of those hard decisions. Are you going to keep living the life you've been living, or are you now going to live a new life? Now, for many of us who are like raised Christian or raised Catholic, we never had to make that decision. We never had to make a decision of like, will I actually change the way I live? Will I change my life direction? Because sometimes we get used to this compartmentalizing. We get used to this thing of like, no, 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 I'm Catholic on Sunday, and then Monday through Saturday, I kind of just do what I want to do. And as long as it's not anything really, 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 really terrible, I'm okay. But in the early church, it wasn't like this. And then everything ramped up in those last 40 days leading up to Easter. And it was a season they called the season of purification and enlightenment. Basically this idea, in the last year, if you haven't really made those hard decisions, now is the time to knuckle down and say, okay, what do I need to purify in my life? What am I, how am I holding on to some things in my life that are holding me back from the Lord Jesus that I need to purify? I just need to leave them behind. And what are some things I need to learn about him? Enlightenment. The season of purification and enlightenment. I think it's a great way to begin this Lenten mission. Because we're only, you know, we're only like a week and a half into Lent. So we're not like at the end, like I have one week left. Like you've got, we got a lot of time left. And to be able to say, okay, Lord, if I was in the early church, if I was becoming Christian, if I was going to get baptized, what are some of the ways that I need to actually change the way I've been living or even change the way I've been looking at the world that's more Christian than it is pagan. Because in many ways, a lot of us, maybe not you guys, but in Minnesota, definitely in Wisconsin, <laughs> is a lot, a lot of pagans. But this idea like, that, that, you know, Christianity, I remember hearing a guy named Chuck Colson, he said this, he asked the question, what is Christianity? And some people would say, well, Christianity is a relationship. Christianity is a religion. Christianity is all these different things. It's church. And Chuck Colson said, you know, at the core, Christianity is all of those things, but ultimately it's a worldview. It's a way of looking at the world that is completely unique. It's a way of looking at reality in a way that's completely unique. It's a way of looking at God that's completely unique. It's actually even a way of looking at other people that is completely unique. I mean, just to think, you know, sometimes we like to have this idea in our multicultural culture that says that all religions basically believe the same thing. We like to kind of think like, you know, so basically it's like this. Imagine there's a mountain, and on top of the mountain is God. And what religions are, are all these different paths up to the mountain. And it's a really sweet idea. It's just not true. The Christian worldview is absolutely unique. It changes. It changes so many things. I mean, just as an example, the way in which Christians look at human beings is very different than the way in which other religions or philosophies look at a human being. It just kind of, I'm, I've, I've, I've used this before, but so if you ever listen to any kind of like CDs or anything we have out there, this will sound like, oh, this, this, this is that one. Yeah, this is that one. So here's the thing. Some of you might not have heard this. Remember the story Jesus tells, the parable Jesus tells about Lazarus and the rich man? Remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? And there's this rich man. I'll recap for those of us who are not familiar. And there's this rich man, and it says that Jesus says, this rich man He dined sumptuously every day. Not like he sometimes feasted like on Sundays or on holidays or on St. Patrick's Day, but he dined sumptuously every day. The rich man was basically an American. And 
and he said he was dressed in fine linen. He, dre he was dressed in purple ro robes. Now, back in the day, purple was the hardest color to get your, your clothes dyed. And therefore, only really, really wealthy people were able to wear purple. Now, this guy was so wealthy that, that it says that uh, the word G Jesus uses is not just, he didn't just have purple robes on. The Greek word that Jesus used to describe his clothes is he was so wealthy, he wore purple underwear. Like his undergarments were purple. Like this guy was so rich. Not the outer layers. They, it's the base layer. The layer that no one else will see. He is so rich that the dude's got purple underwear on. That's how wealthy he is. And outside of his door, lying on the ground, covered with sores, longing to eat from the scraps that fell from the rich man's table with this guy, Lazarus, lying in the gutter. And dogs would come and lick at his wounds. And then Jesus says that every day, the rich man, he just... There's Lazarus lying there in the gutter, and Lazarus would walk out of his house, see him lying there, and just step over the rich man on his way to work. And of course, Lazarus would look up, and that's how we know he had purple underwear on. <laughs> you have this, this recognition of like, what we say, you know, the story goes on, the rich man died, and Lazarus died, and the rich man went to a place of torment, and Lazarus went to a place of beatitude, a place of, of like, like heaven. And that's part of the point of the story that, Laz that Jesus is telling. But now, there's an interesting thing. As Christians hearing that story, we hear that story and we say, like, what should the rich man have done for Lazarus? Helped him, feeded, fed, feeded him, and taught him how to speak it. No, um, <laughs> the rich man should have taken care of Lazarus. He should have helped Lazarus. He should have cared for Lazarus. Now, we look at that and we like, oh, duh, everybody knows that. Now, the truth is, not everybody knows that. Because Christians, we look at Lazarus and we see, we see something very, very different than other people around the world. And I want to just do this really, really briefly, but really quickly, and at the same time, rapidly. Like, what are, what are four different ways, four different worldviews, remember, Christianity is a worldview, what are four different ways a different worldview would look at Lazarus? How would, for example, how would a Hindu look at Lazarus? Secondly, how would a Buddhist look at Lazarus? Third, how would an atheist look at Lazarus? And then fourthly, how would a Catholic Christian look at Lazarus? So quick, first thing, how would a Hindu look at Lazarus? Well, in the Hindu system that arose out of, you know, there's, there's some Vedas and there, there are some things that are very clear about how you care for people in the Hindu system. But what has arisen out of, culturally out of the Hindu system is this, based on the reality that if you're a Hindu, you believe in a thing called re reincarnation. So when you look at Lazarus, what you see is you see a soul trapped in a body. I was talking to a Hindu kid the other day, and he was saying that, he said, no, listen, your body isn't you. Your body's like if you're driving across the country, and you only made, and you're driving in your car, and you left from New York, and you only made it as far as Kansas, your car broke down, you got in a new car, and you kept driving across the country. Your car isn't you. Your car is just the thing that you're in to get you from point A to point B. And so he's saying, like, so idea is if a Hindu looks at Lazarus, what he sees is a soul trapped in a body. The body's not himself. And out of this mentality, out of this vision, comes the idea of the untouchables. Out of this idea, like, who would, who would Lazarus be to a Hindu? He would be an untouchable. So what would a good Hindu do to Lazarus? Nothing. You, you know the thing about untouchables, you don't, you don't touch them. So, in some forms, now not all forms of Hinduism, but in some forms of his, Hinduism, what a good Hindu would do is actually what the rich man did. Because Lazarus is a soul trapped in a body. He's not his body. You don't have to care for his body. Now, again, again, just clarification. There are some forms of Hinduism that would encourage, say, no, compassion and care. For, but at the same time, there's a large strain that arises out of this idea that Lazarus is not his body. He's simply a soul trapped in his body that the rich man actually would have done the right thing. Now, because of this, Gautama Buddha, he was raised as a Hindu, and he didn't like that idea. He didn't like that this was teaching. He walked, he walked out of, you know, he was raised with wealth, and he walked out around the world, into the world, I mean, and he saw suffering, he saw pain, and he said, no, what you need to do is you need to, if Lazarus is lying there, you have to help him. You have to have, he had compassion, and he said, you have to care for someone like Lazarus. Hindu or Buddha asked the question, 
He wa- said, I want to stop suffering. I want, to see, I want to alleviate suffering. And so we asked the question, where does suffering come from? The answer, well, suffering comes from unfulfilled desire. When you want something, but you can't have it. And so, okay, good question. Suffering comes from unfulfilled desire. Where does unfulfilled desire come from? Well, it comes from me. And so we came up with this kind of essentially solution is this, in order to eliminate suffering, you eliminate desire. In order to eliminate desire, you eliminate the one who desires. And you have to realize the enlightenment of Buddha, Buddha or Buddhism is you have to realize that suffering doesn't exist because you don't exist. Suffering is only caused by this perception that reality is real. But once Lazarus realizes that the world around him is an illusion and he simply is an illusion, well, then he won't suffer anymore. That's enlightenment. And so for a Hindu, Lazarus is a soul trapped in a body, but for a Buddhist, Lazarus is neither a soul nor a body. He's simply an illusion. There is no spoon. Have you ever seen The Matrix? So The Matrix is kind of like neo-Buddhist, which is actually a play on The Matrix, neo, right? If you saw it. Anyways, so here's Lazarus. He's, Lazarus, helping you means helping you realize that you're an illusion. How would an atheist look at Lazarus? So if a Hindu looking at Lazarus says you're a soul trapped in a body, and a Buddhist looks at Lazarus and says you're neither a soul nor a body, an atheist looks at Lazarus and says you're a body and nothing else. You're no soul, you're just a body, because if you're an atheist, you were simply a strict materialist. That doesn't mean you like to shop a lot. What that means is that you believe that all, that was a joke as well. That means all there, that means that all you believe there is is just stuff. All there is is just matter. And so essentially, here's Lazarus, a carbon-based life form, but he's no essentially different. There's no essential difference between Lazarus and like your dog. You think about this, if you have an atheist, anybody actually looking at a dog, suffering, if you've had, if maybe you've had this, maybe you had a, a pet that was in deep suffering, it was just absolutely painful, and there's nothing you could do to get, help your pet get better. Out of love for your dog, what do you do? You put him down. You put him to sleep. And if, 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 if a human being is simply another collection of cells, another carbon-based life form, with no greater meaning or no greater destiny than anything else. Because again, if you're an atheist, there's, the world is an accident. And there's no destiny. And there's no destination for anybody. There's no purpose to anything. It's all, if it's all an accident, then there's no purpose to anything. So essentially, when it comes down to Lazarus is no more special than Fido. And when Fido is hurt and he can't get better, out of love for Fido, you put him down. It's very, very possible, not to say every atheist is going to walk around trying to euthanize people, but I'm saying that it's an option for an atheist who would say there's no essential difference between a human being and a dog, that one of the most compassionate things an atheist could do for Lazarus is say, Lazarus, let me help you. Let me give you this extra shot of morphine. You'll go to sleep and all of your suffering will be gone. And that might look like love. Because we have to realize, I mean, just again, if an atheist, atheism is a worldview, but it's a worldview that believes that this world is an accident. And the whole idea is this, if the world is an accident, if God doesn't exist, that means there are no oughts. Like if the world is just an accident, then there's nothing you have to do. There's nothing you ought to do. I remember having some debates with some atheists, and they're like, no, 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 we have this kind of sense of like mutual altruism that we realize that's better than other things. But again, if the whole world is an accident, there's no, you should do, th- do this, you shouldn't do that. There's no oughts if the whole thing is an accident. There's no, there is literally no right and no wrong if the world is an accident. There's no way to live and way you shouldn't live if the world is an accident. And so, and this is the, this is the most offensive thing I'm going to say all night. So get ready. So if, if an atheist helps Lazarus, and, and there are a lot of atheists who are very kind, a lot of atheists who are very compassionate, a lot of atheists who are just really good people, but if an atheist helps Lazarus, there is only one reason, and that reason is because they happen to feel like helping Lazarus. Because again, in the worldview of atheism, there is no right, there is no wrong, it's just whatever you want. 
And again, that's not to say that atheists are walking around trying to like, who can I kill? That's, that's not, I mean, there may be some, but there are also some Christians saying that same kind of thing. So like, let's just get down to this. But in the atheist worldview, if the world's an accident, there's no right and no wrong. And Lazarus is just a body with no soul. So here's the three worldviews. Here's a, here's a, uh, Lazarus is a soul trapped in a body. Here's Lazarus who's neither body nor a soul. Here's Lazarus who is a body and no soul. And then here's the Christian worldview. Here's the Catholic Christian worldview that says, Lazarus, you're a body and a soul together. So what I do to your body, I do to your soul. What you do with your soul affects your body. And not, not only that, this is amazing. This blows my mind. We believe that Lazarus should be helped. Like there's an ought there. Why? Because Lazarus, even if, even if there's nothing we can do to alleviate his suffering, he is made in the image and likeness of God. Now, I don't know if we understand how profoundly revolutionary that idea is, because we like, we all know that human beings are made in God's image and likeness. In fact, our Declaration of Independence says this, right? The very first line, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That is bull. It's not true. Because what it says is, we hold these truths to be self-evident that we're all created equal. I don't know about you, but it's not very self-evident. It is not self-evident that we're created equal. Because there are some people that are stronger than others. There are some people that are smarter than others. There are some people who are just better at being human beings than others. If you look around the world, it is not self-evident that we're all created equal. That idea comes from the Judeo-Christian idea, the Judeo-Christian worldview, that we're made in the image and likeness of God. That's the source of that idea. The source of our, our entire, like, foundation of our government is based on what you get out of Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. If you take the Bible out of that, it's all built on top of that. If you take the Bible out of that, what is your source of information that all human beings are created equal? There is none. If we realize, we realize this, that we've been so shaped, even as Americans, by the scriptures, by the truth that's communicated to us through the Bible, that we think everybody knows this. But everybody doesn't know this. This is actually specifically Christian worldview. I mean, if you were to talk about those early Christians who became Christians in the Roman Empire, they did not think that all human beings were created in God's image and likeness. You know who they thought who was created in God's image and likeness? Caesar and his descendants. Those were the only people who were created in, in the God's image and likeness. Everyone else were simply created to be servants. They were created to be slaves. And along comes Christianity and says, actually, the truth is, you're made in God's image and likeness. And that can never, ever, ever, ever be taken away. Even if you are the weakest human being, you can't be thrown away. Even if you are the least intelligent human being, you cannot be thrown away. Because you know that's what they did in the Roman culture, in the Greek culture. When a child was born, a lot of times they would bring the child to the father, and the father would do this. He would hold out his two fingers. You know how little kids, little babies, they grasp on, they have that reflex where they hold on to whatever you put in their hands? The dad could do this. He could put his fingers in the hands of the kids, and lift up the child, and if the child couldn't hang on, it's too weak, the father could throw the child away. Not strong enough to live. Life unworthy of life. And then Christianity comes and says, no, there's no such thing as life unworthy of life. It's a whole different worldview. It's a whole different way of looking at human beings when it comes to following Jesus. And it all comes from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and Genesis 3. Let's look at that. This is where our worldview comes from as Catholic Christians. You know, I just want to tell a story, and it's a story that you all know. A story from the very first pages of the Bible. And it's a story of how God made us and how, why that matters to us and how it matters to us. And so just kind of go with me on this one for, for a little bit here talks about how God created the first human being. God created Adam, right? And we know, we know this story. And now some of you might say, like, ah, I don't, we don't have to believe in Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 12. Like, well, it's all true. It doesn't have to be literally historically true. 
but it's still true. So let's go through this. I mean, if you want to talk about it later, we can do that. But it says this. It says, that here's God, and he created the man, and he breathed into him the breath of life. He created him in his image and likeness. And then in chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Then the Lord God took the man, whose name is Adam, well done. That was the audience participation for the night. Um, he took the man, Adam, and sent, settled him in the Garden of Eden. And he settled him in the Garden of Eden, it says here, to cultivate and to care for it. Now this is really interesting because God puts Adam in, in, the, in the garden with a purpose. He has a job to do. And there's something about this. As men, we're going to talk about men and women for a little bit tonight. Um, he talks about as men, we have this job. He puts Adam in the garden to cultivate and to care for it. Adam, you are here. You have a purpose. What's that purpose? To cultivate and to care. And yet, that word to care can often be translated as the word to guard. For those of you who have been through the Great Adventure Bible Timeline Bible Study, you know this. That the word to care can also be translated as the word to guard. So here's Adam, and God puts him in the garden, and he gives him a job to do. He gives him a task to do. He gives him a mission. It's very, 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 very manly. And he says, here, Adam, you're here to cultivate the garden and to guard the garden. So you can imagine Adam there. He's like, okay, you know, there's no one else around. Like, he's making signs like, stay off the radishes. No walking on my grass. Like, what's, what's he there to guard? You know, so here's Adam, and he realizes he has this job. He has this mission. He has this task. He's there to guard but he's alone. It says he realizes he's alone. Basically, this whole idea of, I'm here to guard, but what do I guard? He's alone. And so that God says it's not good for the man to be alone. So he says, so he put the man into a deep sleep. And the Greek word for that is he put him into an ecstasy or ecstasis. He took him out of himself. And it says while he was in that deep sleep, he opened up his side and took out a rib. And from the rib, he fashioned the rib into a woman. Now, here's a quick little note. Some people will say, like, you know, well, if you know, the men came first, so, like, you know, I've heard husbands were, like, saying, like, you know, looking at their wives, like, well, you're welcome. You came from my side. You're welcome. And the wives looking at the husbands and saying, well, you came from dirt. You're welcome. <laughs> Sometimes people will say that, that you know, this, this notion of, like, who came first, who's more important. But when I was growing up in my family's house, we had this, in the basement, we had this, one of those original Ataris. You know, the, the original, like, with the, yeah, it was just ancient stuff. We played Pitfall and Cubert and Miss Pac-Man. Actually, I didn't play any of those games. My older siblings did, and I got to watch them play. So while I was watching them play on this little, you know, super small TV, there was this plaque next to the TV that my mom had put there. And it had this poem, and the poem said this. It said, God took Eve from Adam's side, not from his head to lord it over him, and not from his foot to be walked upon by him, but from his side to walk with him, from near his heart to be loved by him, and from beneath his arm to be guarded by him. Again, God took Eve from Adam's side, not from his head to lord it over him, not from his foot to be walked upon by him, but from his side to walk with him, from near his heart to be loved by him, from beneath his arm to be guarded by him. Here's Adam. This is crazy. This is great. I love it. Adam wakes up. When he brought her to the man, when God brought her, Eve, to the man, Adam, the man said, and this is the first words out of Adam's mouth when he sees Eve. At last. <laughs> like, right, he's, he, actually, that's what it says. It says, his first words are, this one, at last. Like, so, you know, all the animals that come to him, he's like, none of these are, none of these are a suitable helpmate. You know, in fact, that some, some, sometimes people have abused that term, the suitable helpmate. You know, the spouse, like, my wife is my suitable helpmate. That means she's my helpmate. That means that she's kind of like, I want a beer. <laughs> Good thing I got married. So sometimes people say, use that term helpmate to mean just kind of like servant or like you're helping me do what I want to do. But actually, on other places of scripture, there's times where it's that, that exact same word called, it's Ezer Konegdo in Hebrew, is used of God. 
God is my helpmate. God is my Ezra Konegdo. So just as easily as the man could say, you're my helpmate, you're my helper, you're my assistant, she could say, actually, I'm God. Um, so it's neither of those, we realize, right? This helpmate means something, something different. And when Adam wakes up and God brings Eve to Adam, he bursts into song. He says, at last, this one is born of my bones. This one is flesh of my flesh. And he goes into this whole thing. He says, this one shall be called woman, for out of her man is this woman taken. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two become one body. I can almost hear Adam just like, I mean, just going crazy, right? Like, finally, finally, I've been here in the garden to cultivate and to guard, and now I know why. And he looks at the woman and says, this is why a man leaves his father and mother. This is why guys build skyscrapers. This is why men sing love songs. This is why men fight dragons for her. And guys, men, you, if you've ever in, fallen in love with anybody, you know that that's exactly how you feel, right? When I was a kid, I used to always, I was, I was taken by Star Wars, right? And I was, I was in the backyard always pretending to be Luke Skywalker or Indiana Jones, pretending to be Indiana Jones. Like this, oh, this whole, my whole, I just summed up my entire childhood up to the age of 19. But I was always pretending to be Luke Skywalker or Indiana Jones. And the reason was not because it was my ardent desire to fight off stormtroopers or to fight off Nazis. is because Luke Skywalker, you know, fighting for Princess Leia. Or Indiana Jones fighting for Marion. Of course, later I found out that Leia was Luke's sister, which is very confusing for, <laughs> for me. But this whole re reality of, it, guys, how, why do we do the stuff we do? So often we do it for her, Right? We have this idea that we just like, no, my mission, I've been here to cultivate and to care. I've been here to guard. And then you find her and you're like, I've been here to guard her. That's why I'm on this planet, to guard her and care for her. That's why Adam breaks out. And this one at last is why a man leaves his father and mother. He leaves everything. This is why he builds skyscrapers. This is why he sings love songs. This is why he fights dragons. You can just imagine Imagine that he's just, finally, I know why I'm here. And it's really, really good. The next line says that the man and woman were both naked, but they felt no shame. This is another way of, just, another way of saying they were completely defenseless and vulnerable to each other. And they were unafraid of being hurt by the other one. Can you imagine being looked at Women, can you imagine being looked at by any man just with that kind of gaze of just, that man will never hurt me. That man will never use me. That man only, he just loves me. Guys, can you imagine being looked at that by, by the woman you love, this gaze of just, I respect you. And I just, you, you're my man. Can you just imagine, you can imagine that gaze. Things are good. But then chapter 3 happens. And in chapter 3 it begins and it says, Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the animals that the Lord God had made. And the serpent asked the woman, Did God really tell you not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? And the woman answered the serpent, well, we, may eat meat of, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. It's only the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, You shall not eat it or even touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will certainly not die. God knows well the moment, you open it, eat, the moment you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like gods who know what is good and what is bad. Now, we sometimes hear that story. Again, I mean, a picture, like, if you had the same kind of picture Bible that I did, you're picturing, like, the garter snake that kind of wrapped around the tree, like, talking to Eve, like, Hello, Eve. <laughs> Did God really say? Because, you know, British, evil. <laughs> That's not true. That's not true. But you can imagine, like, the little garter snake approaching Eve and saying, did God really say that you should not eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden? But the Hebrew word, again, this is just crazy, the Hebrew word for the, for the serpent is the Hebrew word nahash, which is better translated in other parts of the Bible as leviathan, or sea monster, or dragon. And it changes the story. So you can imagine now, here it comes, it says now, the, the dragon was the most cunning of all the animals the Lord God had made. And the dragon approached the woman and said, did God really tell you not to eat of any of the fruit of the trees in the garden? Eve, mm-mm, mm-mm. We can eat of any fruit of the trees, just not, just not that one. 
or else we'll die. And then the dragon says, you will certainly not die. Now, in the Hebrew, there's this idiom. And the idiom is kind of like, a, have you ever like, seen any like mobster movies? Where, like, where it's like someone's leading, le- leading a kind of a statement that leads someone on and it and kind of implies a certain thing. And basically the statement implying something is like this. Like the, the serpent said to the woman, you will certainly not die if you eat of the fruit. Dot, dot, dot. Which implies, but you will die if you don't eat of the fruit of the tree. Kind of like here the mobster comes along and says, you know, hey, do you want to buy some insurance? No? Buildings burn down all the time. You know, sometimes brakes go out on people's cars on windy roads. Dot, 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 dot. Think this is what the serpent is doing. No, 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 you will certainly not die if you eat of the fruit of the tree. Dot, dot, dot. But you will. Here's the dragon speaking. But you will die if you don't eat of the fruit. Here is this un... You might say it's veiled, but I'm going to say an unveiled threat of the dragon to the bride. So Eve looked at the tree, thought it was good for food, pleasing for the eyes, desirable for gaining wisdom, so she took some of its fruit and ate it. And then here's the next and maybe most tragic line of the entire scriptures up to this point. We're only at chapter 3. Eve took some of the fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her. Which... If you've never heard this before, it just, like, changes everything. Here's the guy. Here's the guy who said, Eve, you're the one, you're the one. You're the one that I'll, this is the, you're the reason why I'll leave my father and mother. I build skyscrapers, sing love songs, fight dragons. And here a dragon comes into their garden and goes right up to his bride. And Adam just stands there and is like, gets out of the way. And while his bride is being threatened, while her life is being threatened, Adam has one job, remember? To guard his bride. And what does he do that entire time? He just stands there. And what does he do? He does nothing. What does he say? He says nothing. While his bride gets mowed down by the dragon that he was put in the garden to fight. He ate some of the fruit and, then, and says then the eyes of both of them were opened and I realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Again, if, if it was before they were naked but they knew no shame, that was because why? Because I know this person will never hurt me. Up to this point in the entire story, in the history of humanity, whenever Eve looked at Adam, all she ever saw in his eyes was this gaze of absolute love. Whenever Eve looked, whenever Adam looked at Eve, all he said in her eyes, saw in her eyes was this, this like, absolutely, I just completely, I completely respect you. And now, they have the fruit in their hands, they look at each other, and they see something they'd never seen before. But it's something that everyone here has seen. Eve looks at Adam and she sees that for the first time, this look that my sister is here tonight, you've all seen. As the man that she trusted and as the man that she loved looks at her and does one of these. Hmm. Hmm. Gain them a little weight. Adam looks at Eve and he sees something in her eyes that he's never seen. And men, this is a a sight that we've all seen as well. Eve looks at Adam. (laughs) Nice song. Nice promise, man. That was great. And from that moment on, there becomes this tension between men and women, between humans. And from that moment on, there are two, I would say this, there are two profound lies that attack the woman. There's one profound lie that attacks the woman, and there's another profound lie that attacks the man. From that moment on, from that, that moment, every man is attacked by this one lie from the moment he realizes he's a man throughout maybe the rest of his life. And that lie is this. You don't have what it takes. 
that you are not a man. You are not competent. And so almost everything that a guy does, almost everything that so many different men do, is an effort to kind of push down that lie, to push away that lie, to say, no, actually, I am competent, I am a man, I do have what it takes. I mean, think about this. Why are so many different guys, different men, like car guys? You know, we, when it comes to cars, is all we need in a car is a car that gets us from A to B. But if you walk out into the parking lot, you'll find cars that don't just get people from A to B, they say something about the man. This is, I can drive this kind of car. Because why? Because I have what it takes. Because I'm a man. And that might be like a sports car. It might be like the midlife crisis, kind of like put the top down kind of thing. It could be because I'm, I'm the man. I have what it takes. It could also be something like this. It could be like, in Minnesota, you probably have it here too. Like the truck guys. Listen, I could drive a truck. Look at this. It's tricked out. It's amazing. It's huge. It's taller than everyone else's car on the road. And it's, and it's detailed and it's super clean. You also have the other guys. We have the other guys in Minnesota that are like, no. My car is a beater. You know, how, you know how much of a tough guy I am? I have never cleaned my car once. <laughs> you have some guys, when it comes to like even fixing stuff, when it comes to, to a lot of us men, it's like, no, how do I know I'm a man? I know I'm a man because I can fix anything. There's other guys who say, I know I'm a man because I can pay someone to fix anything. <laughs> and again, some men are like, you know, like, I'm a man, why? I'm the hairiest thing I've ever seen. Other men are like, I know I'm a man. Why? Because I can grow a sweet beard. I know I'm a man. Why? Because I'm fitter than I'm stronger than I'm smarter than I'm. Because I have this lie that keeps hitting my heart. And it keeps saying again and again, and when I wake up, you don't have what it takes. You're not a man. You're not good enough. You're not competent. One of my favorite movies of all time is a movie called It's a Wonderful Life. Y'all ever seen? Y'all ever seen? It's a Wonderful Life with with uh, well, I, I, I don't. What's his name again? Jimmy Jimmy Stewart. That's right. So Jimmy Stewart and Donna Reed, I think is is Donna Reed the, his wife. So Mary Hatch plays Donna Reed. And ever since I was in high school, I had this crush on Donna Reed, which is weird because she's like maybe dead. <laughs> and, but I mean, she's a beautiful woman, and she's just I mean, she's and, and her character is just amazing. And I was always wondering like, why Donna Reed? Why Mary Hatch? Why she becomes Mary Bailey in the movie? Like. Why do I just, am I captivated by this woman? And I realized maybe five or six years ago, why? Have you ever watched the movie? Every time Mary looks at George, she always looks at him with this gaze that says, George, you can do it. She always looks at him with this, this, this look of like, George, I believe in you. Even when George is having his like complete collapse, he's yelling at the kids, why do you make them cry so, George? Even then, she's looking at him like, no, this isn't you. You're a better man than this. I believe in you. And I realized, why do I love Mary Hatch? Because even in my life, that lies hit me. And when I see it in her eyes, I'm like, damn, that would be amazing. That's why... If you're married, wives, I want to talk to wives a second, a second. If you're married, no one except for one other person on this planet has more power when it comes to killing that lie in your husband's heart than you. If you're married to your husband, he's, he, he's around, he's still alive. There's, there's no one on this planet who has more ability to kill the lie that's attacked his heart every day of his life than you, except one other person has more power to kill that lie. Or no one on this planet has more ability to give strength to that lie than you, except for one other person. That other person is his dad. When a dad looks at his son, he says, son, you have what it takes. When a dad looks at his son and says, son, you are a man. When a dad looks at his son and says, son, you're competent. The only other person with as much power to speak against that lie and speak that truth to a man's heart is his bride, is his wife. Because that's the number one lie. It's come against, come against all men. The, the lie that's come against every woman is like it, but it's different. The lie that's come against every woman, the guys that you've ever met, from your grandma to your granddaughter, is this one lie. 
is you're not worth loving right now. And at some point it hits every young woman's heart, and a lot of times it stays with her, is as you are, you're not worth loving. No, 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 you might be worth loving you better, or you different, or you whatever. You prettier, you taller, you thinner, you smarter. But you right now, you're not worth loving as you are right now. And that's the lie in so many ways, so profound ways, has come against every woman's heart. Again, from your grandma to your granddaughter. Every woman you've ever met. And again, why else would you explain? I mean, I know I'm going to get in trouble for this, but why else would we explain, how else would we explain, like, no offense to anyone. <laughs> this is the other offensive thing. I said it was, this is more offensive than makeup. How else would we explain makeup? I remember when I was dating, before I was a priest, um, when I was dating, <laughs> I used to, like, I did this one woman I was getting ready to get married to, and, and we would, you know, I just, she's gorgeous, she's absolutely beautiful, I loved her so much. And then we'd go out, like, to, a, like, a fancy restaurant or go out to, like, a, a dance or something like this, and she'd put makeup on, I'm like, what? What's that? And I'm like, she's like, well, it, it makes me feel pretty. I'm like, but you are pretty. And here is this, even this gorgeous woman who say, but yeah, but, but me, just slightly different, is more worth loving. So when my eyes pop, then I'm even prettier, then I'm even more worth loving. When my da-da-da, da-da, I don't know what the other things are, I, that's the only one I've heard. Um, it's just, then I'm, more, then I'm more worth loving. And again, this is not to criticize tomorrow morning at Mass, like all these people with no makeup on. <laughs> Doing this for you, Father. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> But again, this kind of notion of, think of like how many times, how, how it affects so many women. Is me as I am, it's fine, yeah, I guess, I'm okay. But me, just slightly better, is more worth loving. I mean, this affects so many women to the point where we even have girls on campus who, they like, they don't even try. They're like, you know, the, the hoodie and sweatpants girls who wear a baseball cap everywhere. And we had one of those girls, and she's just wonderful. She's just an incredible girl. But she's, like, in talking with her more and more, you can see it coming, seeping to the top, where it just is, I'm not not getting dressed up. I'm not not wearing makeup because I, I'm free from this lie. It's because this lie has hit me so deeply that I don't want to try and still be unloved. I don't want to make an effort and try to make myself look pretty and find that no one still loves me. I don't want to give everything I am to trying to be better and realize that even me at my best, I'm still not worth dying for. And that lie has hit so many people from our grandmoms to our granddaughters to our wives. And men, husbands, if you're married right now and your, your wife's around, there is no one who can undo that lie with as much power and as much strength as you can. Only one other person on this planet can undo the lie in the same way that you can. Because why? Because you see her, you see your bride in all of the shapes and sizes and all the times of her life without her makeup, with her makeup, when she feels prettiest, when she feels least pretty. And to be able to say, you're my bride and you're worth loving, you're worth dying for. Even at your best and even at your worst. You are worth, you are worth, you are worth loving. Now, not later. That's one of the reasons why pornography is so devastating to marriages and so devastating to a woman's heart, to a bride's heart, because this whole notion of what's the lie? The lie is I'm not good enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not worth loving. And if my husband goes and looks at other women, then it's proof. He actually believes it too. He believes that I'm not worth loving. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not enough. I'm not worth dying for because he proved it by looking at these other women who are pretty enough and are good enough and are apparently worth his time. Not just because she's like, oh, gross. It's because it hurts, hits her heart in such a way that it says, the lie that I've thought ever since I was six years old, I think is true. I mean, I mean that. And women, you know this is true. One of, my, one of my nieces, she's six. And we just had a big family vacation with like 21 of us. It was awesome. It was so great. And the six-year-old was saying, I'm not skinny enough. And all of her parents and, my, and, my, and the grandparents and, and me were like going, what? The kid's a stick. 
I mean, she kind of looks like this, you know? So she's like, I'm not skinny enough. I need to be skinnier. Like, what is going on? The lies hit her already at six years old. And there's no person who can undo that lie like her husband except for her dad. And the dad can talk to his daughter and say, at every step from six to 60, say, my daughter, you are worth loving. You are worth dying for right now. Not you better, not you smarter, not you with better grades, not you prettier, not you later, you right now. You are worth loving. Men, we realize this, right? Dads, you have so much influence you have, over your sons to kill the lie, over your daughters to kill the lie. Sometimes people say, like, well, what is, what's, what's the mom do? Two things. One is, she tells the husband, <laughs> you have what it takes, so that he can do what it takes. But the second thing is this. Oftentimes, here's how it goes. The kids, maybe this is true with your kids, when they're at home and mom loves on them, Sons, yeah, no problem. I have no problem. I know I'm loved. Daughters, no, I have no problem. I know I'm loved. But when they're sent out into the world, they confront a world that tells them, no, 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 no. You're not good enough. You're not worth loving. And moms, they shape their kids at home and realize, let them know there's a protective place here where it's true. And dads send their kids out into the world. They have to speak against the lie. You think about this, and this is what affects all of us. And we're not only, we're not only like separated from each other, like here's women, here's men, and we have this like constant tension of like, I'm not good enough, and this other tension of like, I'm not worth loving, and, and you promised, and this other thing of like, yeah, but you, we also have this separation between us and God that happens in this moment. It's, and it's the most devastating separation because Whereas we can still get along as, as men and women, we can still try, we can still work at it, we can still kind of reconcile some irreconcilable differences. When it comes to us and God, there is, there's, because of this sin, we realize there's this unbridgeable gap between us and God. I mean, that's what happens when, when, we, when we've sinned against God. What happens at this moment when Eve and Adam allow themselves to be mowed down by the dragon and they disobey God, what happens is this this unbridgeable gap between with, with human beings on one side and God on the other side. And the thing is, the thing about unbridgeable gaps is what? They're unbridgeable, exactly. So no matter how hard human beings try, no matter how good we are, no matter how hard we work, no matter how hard we try to be worth loving or how hard we try to be competent, we cannot get to the other side. That's why the image of like God at the top of the mountain and all the roads going up to him, that doesn't work because if you try hard enough, you can get to the top. But the image of had this reality that on this side there is this unbridgeable chasm that no matter how hard we try, we cannot get across. And that's why this amazing, incredible, like unbelievable thing, the worldview has changed. What we believe as Catholic Christians is that at one moment in history, after trying to let us know how much he loves us, God actually becomes one of us. After centuries, trying to communicate to us that actually, I do love you. I am good. You can trust me. Finally, at one moment, in the incarnation, God becomes one of us in order to bridge that unbridgeable gap, in order to basically make an expansion bridge from him to us when he takes on our body. And we realize this, right? That's what the incarnation is, right? When, when God actually becomes flesh. Like the in, you've heard the term incarnation, right? Do you, we're down south, so you all know what, um, like, in Spanish, what carne means. Carne, meat, right? So, so the incarnation is not when God became Mexican. The like incarnation is the in-meatment, the in-fleshment. The, when God became, took on a flesh, took on a body, became one of us. And he bridged that unbridgeable gap between him and us. And there's this crazy thing, this crazy thing that happens in, in, the, in all of this. I can look at that and say, 
Amen. Like, I believe that. Yeah, you know, imagine if we had all of us here and we asked the question like, hey, do you believe that? Do you believe that God in Jesus Christ became one of us to bridge the unbridgeable gap between him and us? I imagine a lot of us would say, yeah, yeah, I totally believe that. Like, 100% believe that. I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm a Catholic. I, I believe this. But here's the thing. What if this is the gap right here, right? Here's God. Gap. Us. What if I'm right here standing there and saying, no, I totally believe that. I believe, 100% believe this. Where am I? I'm still on this side. I can believe it, but I stayed on this side. That's one of the reasons why in the letter of James, James says, he says, I really like James, because James gets, lets me be able to say what I'm about to say. And James says, in James chapter 3, chapter 2, he says, you believe that God is one. You believe that, you know, so James is writing to Christians, like, okay, so you believe, and you may even say this, you believe that Jesus is God. James says this, you do well. Why? Because it's true. He says, even the demons believe that and tremble. You ever thought about that? Like, on this side of the gap, I could say, yeah, I believe Jesus is God. I believe that he is the Savior. I believe he is the Lord. Even the demons believe that. So if you believe that, congratulations, you're now in the category of demon. Well done. James says, you believe God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe that and tremble. Do you want proof, you ignoramus, <laughs> that faith without works, without action, is useless? Because I can stand here and say, I believe that, 100%, I believe this. I believe that Jesus has proven that he is God. And I'm still on this side. Because that's the truth, is that in the first garden, that first Adam, standing next to his first bride, as the dragon approached, whoa. Years later, there came a new garden, and a new Adam, and a new bride. And in the garden of Gethsemane, when the dragon approached Jesus, and attacked his bride, rather than just stepping out of the way. Jesus stood there, took it. Adam was put there to guard his bride, and he didn't do it. Jesus came here to save his bride. And he stood there and he took it. That's why, that's why if you if you have never had, if you're a man and you've never had your dad tell you you're a man, if you've never had your wife say you're good enough, you have what it takes, you have a God who tells you you are enough. In Ephesians chapter 5, St. Paul writes, he says, Husbands, love your wives. Another way to say it is, Men, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Question, how did Christ love the church? By handing himself over for her. How did he hand himself over for her? Like that. Every time, men, if you, ever, if you ever doubt the truth about who you are and your competency and your ability, you are a man, all you have to do, Ephesians 5, look at the crucifix. Because here's God himself saying, you have what it takes to do what? To do that. Husbands, I don't care how long you've been married. I don't care if you've never been married. I don't care where you're at. Men on earth, love your brides. Love the women around you. How? Like that. Here is God himself saying, you have what it takes to do that. You're competent to do that. Love your wives like Christ loved the church and laid himself down for her. To present her holy and spotless. Men, you haven't lost your mission. You've got a better one. You haven't lost the Father believing in you. The Father believed in you so fully that he said, do what my son did. That's your job. That's your mission on this earth. I believe in you. You have what it takes. You're a competent, you're a man after my son's own heart and brides, my sisters. If you ever wonder, like, yeah, I'm fine, I'm worth loving, but not me right now. What you have to do is turn to Romans chapter 5. So all these is Ephesians 5 for the men, Romans 5 for the women, where St. Paul wrote to the Romans and he said this. He said, yeah, maybe, maybe someone might find courage to die for a good person. Someone who was all better, someone who was perfect, someone who was good. 
Paul says, but God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Before we got better, he died for us. So if the lie that's coming against your heart is, yeah, yeah, me better is worth loving. Me perfect is worth loving. Me smarter, me prettier, me perfect is worth loving. Romans 5, God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were still broken, he died for us. So my sisters, if you've never had a dad who could tell you how much you're worth loving, if, you, if your husband has never told you, or maybe you never got married, you've never heard how much you are worth loving, what you have to do is also look right there. Because every time you look at the crucifix, it kills the lie. It's a stake through the heart of the dragon. That men, that's what it takes, and you have what it takes to do that. My sisters, that's how much you're worth. You are worth now. Not you better. You are worth now. You are worth dying for. Here he's standing. I believe that. But I'm still right here. And this is the last thing. Keep in mind the last thing is about seven minutes. <laughs> what does it take? I mean, what do, what do you have to do at this point? If I believe this and I'm standing right here, what do I have to do? I've got I gotta walk, I gotta move, I gotta act. Faith without action is useless. Believing this without making the decision to go doesn't do anything. How many times have we shown up to church and we said, I believe it. What happens on the altar? I believe it. But we haven't actually made the decision to say, I belong to him. That's the difference. I believe in him is very different than I belong to him. It's a lot like bungee jumping. I have this friend, uh, she's a youth minister in our diocese, and when she was in college, she went and studied abroad in South Africa. In South Africa, they have the highest, longest-running bungee jump in the world. And everyone in her class of study abroaders were doing this. And so she was like, no, heck no, I'm not going to jump off. I'm not going to go bungee jumping. Like, but it's the highest one in the world. Like, I'm not going to do this. And they, she was, they were so persistent about it. They were saying, like, no, please, Jen, come do this. You've got to be bungee jumping. We're all doing this. Everyone's going to do it. It's going to bind us together. They even got to the point where they said, we're going to pay for you to go bungee jumping at the highest bungee jump in the world. And Jenny, she said, she looked at them and she said, my mother warned me about this exact scenario when she asked if all my friends were jumping off a bridge, if I would do it as well. <laughs> and she's like, no. So ultimately she didn't do it, but this whole notion of like bungee jumping, sometimes we think of bungee jumping or the leap of faith, like the, sometimes a leap of faith, like to take that step out onto the cross is like someone getting to the top of the highest bungee jump in the world and just like, not even getting harnessed up, just like, I'm going, yeah! That's not what faith is. That's dumb. <laughs> That's what dumb is. One of what dumb looks like, it looks like that. What it is, is this. There's two different, two different visions. One is, I just, I don't even get hooked up. I'm just like, whatever, yes, I'll grab onto the rope as I go. It'll be fine, you know. The other one is, I'm getting hooked up, getting all, okay, it's all there, it's on the legs. It's, you're checking out to make sure it's correctly attached to you and to the bridge. Making sure the rope is both long enough and short enough. But then standing there and just like, okay, yeah, I'm bungee jumping. No, you're not. What faith is, faith in Jesus is, which is different than faith in a lot of other things. Faith in Jesus is, involves both of those together. and involves, I'm trusting in what I know to be true, the facts. And Christianity is rooted in fact. It's not rooted in fiction. It's not rooted in myth. It's rooted in the fact that there was an actual person who died and rose from the dead, attested to and documented as facts. I believe in this. I've checked my harness. I know that this is true. But then it means taking that next movement. And saying, I belong to him then. I've got to live my life differently. Does that sound scary? Yeah, absolutely. My brother's in the special ops, and, and he does these things called halo jumps. Halo stands for high altitude, low opening. 
So it's like a free fall of two to four minutes, I guess. So they're going so high that he's got the air and all that stuff. He's all rigged up. And he got to run out of the back of a plane. And I'm like, how awesome is that? And he says, every time I do it, I am still scared. And he's been doing it for over like 20 years. Like multiple times a day sometimes. Every time I do it, I'm still scared. But I have to remind myself that I can trust my equipment. You're not just running out the back of an airplane. I think someone packed this. Yeah. <laughs> Same with us. We know the truth. The truth is you have a God who became, we have a God who became one of us. Who revealed to us that you are made in his image and likeness. Who revealed to us that he loves us. And then even though we have this separation, and we have this, like, this battle in us sometimes, and we have these lies that attack us, He's the God who says, none of those lies are true. What's true is you are worth loving right now. What's true is you have what it takes. What is true is you can spend your whole life leaning on me and taking that step out. And so here's, here it is. In just a second, we're going to have adoration. Just for a short time, like 15 minutes. It's really brief. What I want to invite you to do is this. If that lies ever come up in your heart, if that lies ever, like, just maybe it doesn't even has a hold of you right now tonight. I invite you to look at the Lord Jesus in the Eucharist and let him kill the lie in your heart. If you've always said, like, no, I believe in him, I believe in the cross, I believe in the Eucharist, I believe in God, but you've never taken that step, like that real step of saying, I believe in him, but not I belong to him. I'm going to invite all of us to do that. To, in, you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to stand up. You just, in the silence of your heart, you can simply kneel in his presence or sit in his presence and say, not, Jesus, I don't just believe in you. Jesus, I belong to you. I don't, just, I don't just agree with you. I want to be yours. Jesus, I don't just know this is true. I'm going to live like this is true. And you don't have to do anything special. But as Jesus is in front of you, just a small, short time, I invite all of us, let him kill the lie. While we were still sinners, he died for us. While we're standing here, let him kill the lie. Have what it takes. You're a man. And to be able to place all of your trust and a God who places himself in front of us. All glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son. Everyone who hears these words say, Come, for the Spirit and the Bride say, the spirit